I'd like to welcome everyone this evening. I'm Anne-Marie Trevelyan and I'm the UK International Champion on Adaptation and Resilience for COP26, uh, as well as being uh, the MP for Barack upon tweed uh, and the Minister for Energy and Clean Growth. And I'm really excited and delighted to be chairing this event with Marsha de Cordova, uh, my fellow MP, who is the Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities. To mark International Women's Day, this 2021, we want to amplify the diverse voices of young women from across the country and give them a seat at the decision-making table. So at this joint event between the APPG on Women in Parliament, Centenary Action Group and Girl Guiding, four Girl Guiding advocates aged 15 to 22 are going to give their maiden speech in which they will present an issue that they want to change and they're going to set out their solution. This will be followed by a Q&A where we will put together questions between each other to hear how we're thinking. If anyone else has a question, please do submit in the chat. Now over to Marsha. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Can I just say a very good evening to you all and thank you for inviting me to be part of this session. I'm also delighted to be here, but also to be co-chairing um, with Anne-Marie this evening, obviously celebrating International Women's Day as well as it being at Women's History Month. And it's really brilliant to be here with the Girl Guide and Advocates. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your maiden speeches. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've been um, the Member of Parliament for Battersea in South London for just under four years. And I remember my own maiden speech of 2017. Whilst I focused on my constituency, I spoke quite passionately about disability rights as it's a topic that is so important to me. And I've been committed to the diversity in decision making. And I always believe we need more women in, in from all walks of life, you know, it, it represented in parliament and indeed government as Anne-Marie currently is as well as I believe better representation really does lead to better decisions and better policies. And, you know, it's so important that we have, you know, those diverse voices and for us like things like the Equality Act really helped to make Parliament more more representative and um, this is by no way means to say that it's it we've done our job there but we certainly have made huge strides over the last um, decade and in my role as the Women and Equalities Shadow Secretary you know it's very broad and intersectional but you know I seek to tackle some of the injustices around economic social and health that are faced by many of our communities, including women, disabled people, our ethnic minority communities, and especially uh, our young people uh, as well. But I also want to you know, demand and call for greater representation. We need good representation and leadership across all sections of society, and that includes politics. And we know that because we're in a pandemic that it has had a huge impact on, on issues around representation for women, we have to really ensure that the voices of young women and the voices of girls are absolutely heard and listened to because there have been many issues that have been massively overlooked, things like childcare and issues around domestic abuse and also online abuse. And really the virus, the pandemic has done so much more to not only open all of our eyes to some of these challenges, but they've also exacerbated them, especially when it comes to young women. And that's why I'm hugely grateful to Girl Guiding and CAG for all the work that they do in lifting up the voices of young women and girls and campaigning for equal representation. I'm also delighted today to be joined by the four fantastic advocates who will be, you know, go, who are going to be presenting their maiden speeches on key issues that they think are important to the UK but also are important around the world. So enough from me and without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker who is Henrietta to talk about something that is hugely important to all of us and that is the climate crisis and its impact on women and girls. Henrietta, I welcome you to make your maiden speech. Hi, thank you. Really excited to be on here. I'm Henrietta. I'm 16. I'm a proud girl guiding advocate, Brownie Young Leader and Ranger. Now, I want to be an MP to instill change, not only in my local community, but the wider world, to ensure future generations can flourish. I'm from the county that no one ever seems to have heard of, Worcestershire, in a rural village where it's not unusual to see cows rather than people wandering the streets. 
To me, it's essential that we do our best to protect, to all protect our environment, no matter our background. And for me, it's about making those connections anywhere between what we do as individuals at home and the impact this can have anywhere in the world. We all want to, we all have a role to play in improving our futures. And put frankly, as a young woman, I want to make my voice heard. An issue I'm so passionate about is climate justice and how that leads to social justice. Climate change is an existential threat that without doubt affects women and girls disproportionately, particularly in developing countries where the emissions of the global north, sorry, whether the emissions in the global north are affecting countries that produce just a fraction of the emissions themselves. And without our action, it's only going to get worse. Climate change is exacerbating the gender divide. UN figures indicate that 80% of people displaced by climate change are women. This is because they're primarily the ones working in primary sector jobs because of the lack of education girls have, stemming from sexism, that crucially rely on the marvellous ecosystems that we are destroying. The devastating effects on the planet can have an equally devastating impact on individuals. For example, without droughts and floods, a family's income could plummet so much so that girls are sold off as child brides. Or when the climate crisis forces migration, it's the women that are left at home, stuck in a cycle of poverty, or women exposed to rape and trafficking. So here are my solutions, as it's not all doom and gloom. Firstly, through their policies, the government should make it easier for us as individuals to make changes. Eco-conscious choices need to be easy and accessible. So we have to start local, even when thinking global. Public transport needs to be more available in all communities even the ones with cows running down streets. And we can preach about sustainable period products all we want. I mean, a pack of pads contains the equivalent of four plastic bags. But when people cannot afford the initial costs of buying the eco-friendly products, what are they to do? I want to change this so it's accessible and desirable to make those eco-friendly changes, to cut down on emissions, which as we know, cause such irreversible harm. My second solution is education. It's the lifeline to prosperity, whether that's educating and informing others about the crisis we're in, so we can adapt our livelihoods, change policies and influence others, or ensuring girls in the most deprived areas have the qualifications to escape the poverty created by climate change. And of course, it's crucial that we put the very marginalized communities, the women, the girls, at the forefront of this fight. Girl guiding has empowered me, has given me the confidence to speak out. Seeing my brownies learn and develop their voices has instilled a passion in me to help others. Girls really can lead the change. Girl guiding's gold attitude survey found 88% of girls and young women feel it's urgent that we do more to protect our environment. And I agree. And we can make a difference. As Greta Thunberg says, no one is too small to make a difference. So we simply cannot just be acknowledged. We must use our voices at conferences like COP26, in policy making and in politics. After all, we cannot establish true social justice to ensure women are not compromised anymore in the climate emergency without ensuring we're listened to and can thrive in this world. It's ours and it's our sisters' lives at stake. Thank you. Wow, that was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much, Henry. That was that was brilliant. And you know. You set out the issues, you know, climate justice really will lead to social justice. You set the issues out and you also set out the solutions and the challenges that each and every one of us can play and the role that we all have to do and play in this area as well. Starting from the local, but going all the way up to be an advocate for the voices of women and girls uh, internationally around the globe. So very well done for that. 
So moving on to our next speaker. So now we have Katie, who will be talk, speaking to us this evening about the pressures that girls face, particularly online. Thank you, Katie, and over to you. Good evening. I am from North Wales, and I'm currently a girl guiding British Youth Delegate. I would like to thank the Right Honourable Anne-Marie Trevelyan and the Right Honourable Marsha D. Dokova for hosting this event and providing young women with the opportunity to share our maiden speeches. I am proud to be a youth representative, creating positive change by sharing innovative ideas and speaking out on topics that affect the next generation is inspirational. 59% of girls aged 11 to 21 said the pressure from social media causes them the most stress. This is nearly two thirds of all young women facing extreme pressure from something intended to enable the sharing of thoughts among friends. Clearly, change is needed to tackle social media's excessive focus on the stereotypical female appearance, which is increasing the already intense pressure on young women and girls. Young women see the image of a perfect woman practically every time they open their phone. Social media is filled with influencers and advertisers, all reinforcing a young woman's perception on what they should look like. Whilst the ability to communicate with friends and family is incredible, girls predominantly see a stereotypical woman as thin and pretty, with perfect makeup, hair and clothes, which does not represent the female population today. How often do you see a woman of colour or a woman in engineering displayed as typical on your social media? Most women who don't fit the typical expectations of society today are portrayed as special, with the focus being placed upon the abnormality of their success or appearance. This reduces their ability to be a role model for girls who see themselves represented in these supposedly atypical women. Alongside the overemphasis of the ideal woman, diet products and unhealthy exercise plans are constantly promoted, leaving young women feeling ugly and not good enough. Why, in today's society, do only 35% of girls aged 11 to 21 feel like they can be themselves wherever they go? I propose three policy measures to tackle this increasingly severe problem. Firstly, labelling for airbrushing and digitally altered images to be a legal requirement on any form of advertisement or on any social media influencers' posts. Enabling young women to see the realities of a female body and the genuine effects of any beauty product. This will boost body confidence as women will compare themselves to a real female body. Secondly, legislation to include unconscious bias on the education syllabus teaching young people about gender discrimination and how to challenge the current female stereotypes. This education would enable young people to see the realities of the female body, taking the focus away from the marketer's image of the perfect woman and their manipulation of models in advertising. Finally, legislation to inhibit social media companies from promoting dieting products and weight loss clubs to under 18s, which is something 68% of girls aged 11 to 21 believe is necessary. The implicit promotion of these unhealthy diet products is dangerous for girls to be witnessing and accepting as a normal part of life. And we need to do something to alter this now. The dangerous effects of pressures on young women through social medias are clear. We, as female representatives, need to do more to change this. Health and happiness needs to become the new perfect. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Health and happiness there really should become the new perfect. That was brilliant, Katie. And, you know, really giving so much expression to what has been the huge pressures of social media and the impact that it has. On our, on our young women and our girls. And your, I think all your, all of your, um, your solutions there were, were pretty much spot on. So thank you uh, very much for that. Um, moving on, we now have um, Maddy, who will be speaking to us about the crucial issue, a really important one actually as well, is around representation of women in politics. So over to you, Maddy. Thank you. 
Um, hello, my name's Maddie uh, and I'm 22. As an MP, one thing I'm very passionate about is the representation of women in politics. There are currently 220 women MPs in the House of Commons, out of 600 MPs in total. That is a rep representation of 34%, which, considering pretty much half our country is made up of women, doesn't quite seem right. Throughout history, women and politics have had a rocky relationship. Women were not allowed to vote until 1918, and even then, only certain women were allowed to have this, their say in how the country was run. In the same year, women were allowed to run for parliament and the first female MP was elected. Since then, the number of women MPs has risen at each general election, but at a very slow rate. I think it is important that men and women have equal representation in all parts of life, but particularly in parliament, as this is where decisions, decisions are made that then filter down throughout society. If parliament is equal, then this sets a precedence that can be followed by everybody else. This can also make a huge difference to girls and young women who can look up to these women and see themselves in their position. As a young woman myself, the world often seems swayed in men's favour, but I've also noticed things changing, slowly but surely. I've been a member of Girl Guiding since the age of seven, and this has made me feel very empowered as a woman. Growing up, surrounded by other strong and inspirational women who have taught me that being a girl does not mean you are any less capable, has really inspired me to aim high and lead myself. I'm very, very grateful to these women and other women MPs throughout history for inspiring me to get to where I am today. As a young girl, I often looked up to women in positions of power and in decision-making positions. It reassured me that I could reach that position as a woman in the world. I have always passionately believed in equality in all forms, but as a woman myself who has experienced discrimination based on my gender, I would love to see this improve. As an MP, I want to continue to help more girls aspire to be members of parliament and one way I believe this can be encouraged is through education. From my experience, the only real education of politics we had at school was history. And as we know, much of historical politics is made up mostly of men and very, very few women. This is often a child's first experience of politics and that gives girls the initial impression that politics is a man's world. When girls and young women grow up, they have dreams and aspirations for their life. Often these are started at a young age. I truly believe that if they were shown a more diverse range of stories of women in positions of power in school, when they're becoming themselves and starting to plan their futures, we would see a lot more women aiming to achieve this goal. It would also normalize this as a legitimate career for women of all backgrounds. I also believe that boys would grow up knowing that women, women are more than capable of taking on these roles and will be able to see the impact they can have on their futures. They'd also be able to see how well men and women can work together in positions of power. The only representation of women in politics really in history is the suffragettes, which show women having to fight for a basic right. Don't get me wrong, I believe it's important that we remember these amazing women who fought for our right to vote, and I will always be thankful to them. But I also believe it's important for young people to learn about current politics so that they can see women can be and are powerful and respected members of our government. Mm. Therefore, I would propose to add politics to the national curriculum from the age of 10, and make it a consistent feature in a young person's education, including a focus on diversity in politics in the modern world. Another important point is that Girl Guiding's attitude survey, 64% said that they thought more girls would consider going into politics if there was less judgment of a woman's appearance. With the rise of, rise of social media, we know that there is a lot of pressure on girls and young women to look a certain way, and this is not helped by the media. Female politicians are not immune to this, and they are often subject to sexist and misogynistic headlines on a regular basis. This gives young women the view that their ideas and opinions are not important, but how they do their makeup and what shoes they wear are. It also gives them the impression that the world of politics is a hostile environment and does not make it very appealing to a young generation of leaders. Therefore, I would propose that women are given the same treatment as men in the media and ask that headlines and stories about women's appearance are not published. After all, what relevance does this even have? Thank you for listening to me today. I hope you enjoyed what I had to say. I hope that we can inspire a new generation of leaders and I can't wait to see what they do. I feel very safe in their hands. Thank you so much, Maddie. That was incredibly inspiring. And, you know, we can all imagine you, people like yourselves, really making your way into politics and actually bringing about that change that really does need to happen. With your solutions there, you know, again, we're, we're so spot on. It's so important that we teach and educate young people about politics. Um, I'm sure if we all reference back to when we started to learn about politics, we would probably have lots of our thoughts already formed. So 
it's so important that we really teach our young people about education, empower women and, and, and girls to really step up and be confident about who they are and not have to worry about their appearance. And so things like, you know, women and men being given the same treatment in the media, I'm sure Anne-Marie would agree with me on that point, that it, it's absolutely crucial because what, what, what dress I wear or shoes or bag I've got is, is so relevant to what anyone has to say. So thank you so very much for that powerful speech there. So finally, um, last but by no means least, we have Kate to talk to us about bullying and mental health. This is such an important uh, subject matter um, affecting our young women. So thank you so much, Kate, and over to you. Hello, um, I'm Kate. I'm 21 years old. I'm from South Wales and I'm a member of the Girl Guide and Advocate Panel. I want to be an MP to stand up for and support people who have often felt a bit excluded and show them that everyone has a space where they belong, no matter how they have been made to feel. When I was younger, I never felt girls like me could achieve things like becoming an MP as to get somewhere you couldn't be kind to others or work with people to get something. You had to hide your ability if you were academic. And plus, only the popular girls get picked for things. As an MP, I would want to change how bullying in schools is addressed and handled. In particular, the support offered to victims of bullying, and especially those who have experienced it for a long period of time, as it affects their mental health. This topic is very important to me, because I was bullied in both primary and secondary school for a period of about 10 years on and off. Some of it in both settings had a large focus on harmful gender stereotypes, particularly body image. For example, many of the other girls in primary school wore clothes that were for younger age sizes, and this was seen positively. So if you did not wear these sizes like me, then you were considered fat. Looking back at it now and remembering how many of their mothers focused on weight and diet, I can see how gender stereotypes caused this bullying as they pushed the idea that women should not be fat and had to diet. Girl Guiding feels it's important to recognise how some forms of bullying can affect girls differently to boys, and I believe it is part of a wider issue. Therefore, it is important that schools teach pupils about issues such as sexism, racism, homophobia and other forms of discrimination that can lead to pupils experiencing bullying. If pupils are taught about these issues, that this behaviour is unacceptable and the impact it has on those ex who experience it. It may not stop it in all forms, but it should stop many people from abusing others for these reasons by understanding what they are actually doing. Every year, Girl Guiding runs the Girls' Attitude Survey. And in 2019, eight out of every 10 of the girls surveyed had experienced bullying or some form of unacceptable behaviour. This is a concerning, but sadly not surprising figure, which shows just how important it is that young people feel able to speak up about it if so many experience it. When they speak up, it is important that we listen to them so they feel their experience is valid when they report a case of bullying and do what we can to support them, as nobody who was bullied should ever feel it is their fault. For me, an important aspect of this issue that needs to be properly addressed is the mental health support provided for many people who experience bullying. Being bullied in school still affects my mental health many years later and is the basis for my social and general anxiety disorders. I know I will probably experience some form of anxiety for the rest of my life, but I will always wonder how I would be now if I'd received support earlier. Therefore, it's important to offer support to young people who experience bullying, as they should never have to live with it for the rest of their lives. As an MP, I would ensure all schools can offer counselling sessions with properly trained counsellors to provide sessions with young people so that they can receive sufficient help from trained experts. It's important that sessions are available for survivors of bullying, to have some refuge from the situation, to feel properly safe and be able to start to recover. 
When I was in sixth form, my school introduced a nurture room for people who had these types of experiences, where as well as getting wellbeing support, they could go to do fun sessions and just be themselves. I think a nationwide scheme like this is needed to start properly helping survivors of bullying sooner rather than later. I have now realised that if you want something, go for it. No matter what someone tells you or how society makes you feel, different is good. Different points of view and experiences help us see things in a variety of ways to make effective change. No girl is too little to try. She just has to give it some welly. Thank you for letting me speak today. Wow, Kate, thank you so much uh, for that incredible maiden speech. And thank you for sharing your experiences. And I think you should be amazingly proud of the fact that you can reflect on your experiences, but also in your speech, talk about solutions, things that need to happen to improve the experiences of our young people in schools and some of the, the ways that that can happen. And obviously things like counselling and the mental health support that could be provided in schools could actually go a long way uh, to making a, diff making a real impact. But more importantly, you talked about, you know, being different, difference is a, it's a good thing. We're all different on this call. That doesn't make us any less or any more better, but it really is about true and society within which we all live. So thank you for that. And can I just say to, to each of you, you, you each gave, I mean, amazing maiden speeches. And I, I'm fairly, I can say, speak for Anne-Marie here as well and say just how fantastic each of those speeches were. And, you know, you should be so, so proud of yourself. And I'm giving you a really virtual, um, along with Anne-Marie and others, because it was absolutely incredible, really proud. And I only just wish that we could be in a room together um, and hear and hearing these speeches. Um, and also it was really excellent to hear each of you give your insights into really important issues um, of our time. And so now I'm going to hand to Amory now, and you know, she's more gonna have an opportunity for Amory to, to uh, share some questions with yourselves, I believe. So Amory to share the question, thank you. Thanks, Marsha. Um, Hannah. <coughs> um, if we, do you want to marshal colleagues, if there's anyone, I know sally Ann, if you're on the line, we want to really have the chance to, in a nice way, not like it is in the chamber perhaps otherwise, <laughs> challenge, challenge our fellow young MPs here uh, on what they're saying. Um, it's it's quite, sometimes quite a, quite a brutal experience in the chamber when uh, someone on the other side stands up and declares that you're absolutely wrong and you have to, on your feet, uh, find a way to either well either you can ignore them that is always an option but that's somehow that's sort of cheating isn't it um, you never do that <laughs> no well I've never found that that's not my way but to try and actually you know really understand what the question is I think the beauty of you know listening to all of you and the the the, the propositions you're putting forwards you absolutely encapsulate the key challenge which is that being able to understand the issues around you and that different people come to you know the same space in a different way is critically important as MPs because we only make progress actually when we work as as teams so on a particular subject where you have cross-party um, consensus you might not agree on all the detail but a sense of purpose to drive an issue forwards is when you have the most success so um, if I may Hannah I will I will start I'm going to I'm going to cross-pollinate your thinking if that makes sense, because what I've heard from all of you in different ways um, is that objectification is one of the greatest challenges that as women uh, we are still struggling with. Um, and trying to trying to understand how we get over that. And so I'd like each of you um, to identify something that either you feel objectified by or, um, you know, you you have experience where you've seen it done to your friends uh, and why why you think that is um, should be undone or not done. I'll give you an example. I often wear long boots. I'm, I'm famous for my long boots. The reason I wear them is that I get very cold feet. And if I keep my calves warm, I don't get cold feet. So I've always worn long boots. But in the chamber, a very male environment, it's often commented upon. In fact, I got a Daily Mail article 
all about my boots once. Gosh, how exciting was that? And they're lovely boots. I love them. It was the blue pair. I have them in every color. Um, and that was the article. It wasn't about the speech I'd meant about defense and about how our soldiers needed better housing. It was about my boots. Uh, I had a proper go at the Daily Mail, I have to say. Uh, and they didn't even see the problem. So there, there we have the channel. So I want you to each come forward with something that either you've experienced as a sense that you felt was objectifying you through something that wasn't about you, but was something that was um, identified as you and misrepresented you. So who would like to go first? Who's feeling brave? Maddie, go for it. I'll go first. Um, I think, I, I think this is what you're asking anyway. I, I don't really wear makeup ever, um, partly because I would rather spend another 10 minutes in bed in the morning <laughs> um, than get up earlier and put makeup on. Um, but partly just because it's not something that's ever really um, been something that I've wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been called ugly before purely because I don't wear makeup. Um, wow. Not so much, to be fair, I, I'm surrounded by a pretty group, good group of friends now. But when I was younger, mm. I had friends who would say that I was ugly and they would buy me makeup for my birthday or for Christmas um, to try and make me wear it. Um, and that's kind of made me want to wear it less. <laughs> I'm quite <laughs> strong willed. And if someone says I should do something um, like that, then, mm. then I'll just not do it. Um, but yeah, and I've always felt that's quite a big thing. And I've got a younger sister who... Um, really into makeup and does it but she does it because she enjoys doing it and she likes like the artistic side of it which I think is great um, but I do think there's a big big pressure on women that are just expected to wear makeup all the time um, and I've definitely been I would say objectified before by people um, because because I don't um, mm. yeah I would definitely say that's something that's that's affected me well, that's, I think that's really powerful and then fits absolutely, I think, into that character. But, well, you know, first of all, well done for, you know, sticking sticking to your guns. And indeed now, you know, I imagine persuading people that, you know, this is this is the way you do things and that's completely fine. That's fantastic. Um, ladies, anyone else? I think um, for me, I've I've been quite lucky and I've, I've not directly really received any objectification. Um, or that I can remember, um, mm. but I feel there's like this, uncon this, this unconscious bias almost towards myself, and I'm sure many mm. women feel that, like, you have to look your best all of the time, mm -hmm. and like, I choose to wear makeup because it makes me feel pretty, and it makes me feel nice, um, and I'm doing that for me, but then are you, I feel like this probably goes through a lot of women's heads, is why am I expected to look very presentable compared to our male co counterparts and that extends all the way from school and things like um dress codes and all that kind of stuff and mm. compared to just going out in your daily life like going to the supermarket um but i think something that quite interesting was um i think it was last year start of last year um tracy Bra braben a mm -hmm. uh, labor mp and um, there was quite a a case and she wore a dress and her shoulder oh, yes. was showing heavens yes. yes and um she she was speaking and all and on the tabloids and everything it was all about why on earth was she wearing this dress mm -hmm. and um she actually in you know in defiance of this blatant sexism um she she put the dress on auction and actually raised over twenty thousand pounds for girl guiding um, which was so amazing, you know, utilising this um, mm. for the better. Um, and it, it just demonstrates that we can take action against it, but like what women have to face on a day-to-day -day basis mm. and trying to make a difference is more disgusting, really, and hopefully we can change that. Yeah, I think that's right. Yes, Tracy, yes, is definitely not one shy of standing up uh, to criticism, which is fantastic. And, you know, it is, I think it's very frustrating and very sad that it still is so, but actually, you're right, it, it requires strength. And, you know, it's, for me, it's a form of bullying, effectively, and you have to stand up to the bully and, and say, this is me, you know, you don't, you don't have to like me, but you do have to be polite. And I think, I think that's, a, I think so that's really, really powerful. Um, Hannah, did you want me to go to Anne? Um, yeah, and then um, we could go around in a, in a, I could see that Sally Ann's got a hand up as well. So maybe, Perfect. Um, yeah, leave it for two. <laughs> Hi, Anne. Hi, Anne. 
Hi. <laughs> All yours. What's your question? Oh, I've got a question. I thought I was answering that question. <laughs> oh, well, you can, Amy, well, you're very welcome to if you'd like to, absolutely. Or if you'd like to challenge okay. the girls with something. No, absolutely. Ask that one first. That one first. While, while I'm answering it, I'll think up a question. But can I just say apologies? I had another meeting and I've only I only caught Kate's um, maiden speech, which was excellent. And, and I can tell that the others will have been fantastic as well. And I'm, But I see it's been recorded, so I'll be able to go and watch it again, hopefully. Um, no, I was just going to talk about um, uh, when Nicola Sturgeon and Theresa May, as First Minister of Scotland and Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, had a top-level meeting um, about Brexit. And um, now I used to go, I lost my seat between 2017 and 19. Mm. And I did a lot of work in other parts of the world with women who wanted to get into politics, but were facing the kind of misogyny and everything. So I was training them and I always used this image and I can't remember which newspaper it was. I can guess, but the front page of this meeting, it was a real kind of important crucial summit and the front page was a picture of the two of them sitting together discussing didn't say anything about what they were talking about what it said was never mind Brexit. never mind Brexit. we've got legs it because they have legs and those legs were shown in the photo and I mean the men male politicians have legs as well Nobody notices, nobody cares, and nobody should be noticing their legs either. It was really disrespectful um, to both of them. So, uh, yeah, so that was the example I was going to give, but I have to come up with a question. Um, oh, let me think. <laughs> Here you have, you have four new young MPs in front of you, and you have the opportunity to, to challenge them on their thinking. Right. OK, here it is. So I'll do this because I heard Kate's. OK, so Kate, I really liked what you had to say about counselling being available to all young people. Had a conversation with a younger relative at the weekend who believes that every young person, whether they want or think they need it, should get it from a very early age on a weekly basis to strengthen their ability to stand up for themselves, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I said to her, I love that idea. But what in government spending would you take away in order to pay for what you want? And that question can go to everybody because you'll all have called for something that you care passionately about. How would you, it's not your job, but when you're in government, it would be. How would you pay for the new thing that you want the government to do? What would you, what would you stop paying for? It's a really good question, Anne. Thank you for that. Who'd like Ooh. to go first? Thank you. I'll give you. I'll give you. And also, I I once had a bright idea which I suggested to then Chancellor of the Exchequer Philip Hammond, who said exactly that. So that's ten million pounds, Henry. Great idea. What am I going to stop doing? And I had to go away and come up with a bright idea. I had to go and find something that was not working properly. <laughs> and then he, he did. Uh, he relented. Oh, so, good. Um, so it's so possible. Would I, Anne Marie. <laughs> <laughs> Right then, ladies, who wants to go first? What do you think government's wasting money on that we could spend better elsewhere? Um, I would have to say on this one, with my topic being on social media, I think rather than using government tax money, you could probably put a lot of it back onto the social media companies if the legislation was written correctly. I mean, they're all multi-billion dollar corporations. I'm sure a few million going into helping young people's mental health can't be classed as a bad thing. I like that. A social media tax. Very good. Good answer. That's very good, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else got any, any thoughts on bits of government that they don't think we should be spending money or should be less important and there's always the challenge is actually it's all it's choices government is always about choices um so it's it's balancing your choices um and your priorities that's always the challenge of government because there's never you know enough money and there's lots of things you have to do um so uh that's an issue gone marsha what would you stop doing so that you could have uh Ooh. proper support for every child well, I'm going to be honest, it's interesting you should say, um, ask me that question, because it's a, it's a very good question. And you're absolutely right when you talk about it's all to do with choices. Um, and so hmm, let me think about that. But I, I would want to see um, more investment going into young people, obviously. And I would look for areas where we can have greater taxation on 
so whether that would be on issues like things like social media because I don't think we, we do enough there but also I would like to see some of the tax loopholes closed so that we can avoid some of the um, the areas where people aren't paying their fair share of taxes and then we can invest those in services for young people. Excellent, thank you Marcia. Uh, young guides any more? Shall I go to Sally Ann and see what her challenge is to you all? Yeah, I've um, got one. I, I, I agree with all of you. I think having more sufficient taxes, uh, for example, particularly on the climate, is what um, what we're putting in will most definitely get back. You know, what's the point in saving all this money if um, we don't really have a if we don't have a habitable planet to live on? Um, so I think it's important that we actually start taxing the the fossil fuel industries, for example, or the corporations mm -hmm. polluting so much ensure that they're actually taxable and held accountable for um the pollution that they are emitting and likewise ensuring that companies are are or companies are taxed appropriately um to ensure that we're not impeding on the on the most vulnerable in society so that they don't suddenly have to pay huge amounts of taxes who are affected the most by climate change but instead ensuring these corporations which are the perpetrators of this um are taxed properly so that we can benefit everyone in society. I think that's a that's a really powerful argument, Henry. And actually, the, the challenge, and that's part of the one of the key elements of COP twenty six, is that conversation about carbon pricing, um, which will effectively is we're trying to get to a point which says that clearly the polluter pays as you, as you describe, um, but that that will involve uh, when you follow it through to its logical conclusion. All the, all the products that we buy that are presently imported from China, which are made using fossil fuel energy, uh, would therefore become more expensive by definition. So there's a really interesting shift in costs, which has potential to alter dramatically the way, um, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, flows works. And there's, it's, a, it's very live conversation and it's very, very challenging to get global agreement. There's you know, some suggestions here, and there are a number of our colleagues who are keen to say we should lead the way and just do it domestically and have what are known as um, carbon border adjustments, which says if they're goods that you're importing, uh, which have been made with fossil fuels, they should be more expensive. But that will potentially just skew uh, and make very imbalanced the market and make the most vulnerable no better off. Um, so that's a key part of the COP narrative with all countries to move forwards and understand how we have a global pricing system to try and really get to grips with that. So that's absolutely, it's absolutely critical. So watch, watch COP closely because it's, it's a hard question, but it's absolutely critical to get it right. Um, Sally Ann, do you want to come in with your question? I've got lots of questions, but I'll go with one first. And just listening to your um, maiden speeches was absolutely fantastic. I was really impressed. But one of the things um, that really highlights uh, with it with me, with what you're all really talking about, the issues on social media, the bullying problems we've got and everything else is, do you think it's a government's role to put in place policies to build up resilience in young people? And if so, what should we do? If not, who should be dealing with building up resilience in young people? That's quite a hard question, isn't it? Well, that's, a, that's a big question, Sally, it's very good. I, um, I have some thoughts. Go on, Maddie. Okay. I, um, I think, I think as, like, as I mentioned in my speech, I think it is down to education. Um, I think, you know, I'm very lucky that I've been brought up around very strong women, both within Girl Guiding and in my family and the people around me that have um, taught me that resilience. Um, and I, I'm very lucky. But I see I run a, a ranger unit, um, a guide unit, and I've just started running a brownie unit as well. And I see in all of those units, I'm in quite, I'm in Cheltenham, I'm in quite a you know, well, well area, the majority of people around me live quite comfortably. Um, but even in those situations, doesn't necessarily always mean they have the people around them to teach them that. Um, and I really think it is the role of the government, partly um, to maybe pass that on to things like schools, um, to, to try and 
educate them more on on how to be more resilient because I think it is it is a skill um I think you, you know and I, I really like the idea of young people having um regular counseling sessions and things like that because I I'm not afraid to say I've had counseling and it really really helped me when I was going through a difficult time um but I also think it another thing that might would be very beneficial uh, I mean I know all my fellow advocates and delegates here would agree um, that girl guiding has been a big part of making me who I am and I think it would be great for the government to um, advertise those organizations more and 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 um, make them more of like um, a publicly known uh, service I suppose um, because I think especially girl guiding and scouting we have this kind of um, people see us as this old organization and we sit and we tie knots and we we sing songs around a campfire and we but girl guiding does so much more than that and teaches young people and I know scouting is the same for boys and girls teaches young people so many life skills that you won't get anywhere else um, and I think that would be a really positive thing for the government to help organizations like us and I'm sure there's many more organizations out there that, that do the same thing for young people I think it'd be really beneficial for more people to know of us and to be able to, to take advantage of um, of the services that girl guiding offer to young people. Thanks, Maddie. Any other ladies? Our young MPs? Take on Sally Ann's challenge? Yeah, um, I think resilience is important, and I, but then I also feel that um, there are whilst it's important for some children or in some situations you there is a point where you have to stop you can't like you can't just keep putting up with these things or fighting them back and they just get a point where it is just too much for one person to handle and then that's where I think like Maddie has said you need these spaces whether it's clubs in school counseling girl guiding to almost let give them a chance to start again and build back up and build that resilience, but in a way that will help them to deal with these things, but not just tackle them, but not put up with them um, and just finding that line. I think what mm. government policy could do is just maybe make rules for say social media companies more sh stricter with the sort of the reporting and the handling to just help serious issues be dealt with more mm. so whilst we need resilience we also need to like be helping these people and just find that balance thanks kate and i think that's very wise mm. excellent so now have you got another question burning you said you had lots i'm intrigued i do have another one <laughs> <laughs> i wondered um this is quite a this is a very difficult question, I think, as well. And it's to all of you, do you think women should act and behave like men to be taken seriously? Very Katie. good question. Mm -hmm. I strongly disagree that women should have to change to be respected in any sense. I think the fact that society believes that men should be more respected is the issue at fault really and it needs to be a complete change in the whole what I would say from a very early age education to resolve this. I mean from a young age I'm sure many people here can agree you get handed the nurse's dress or the doll set you don't get handed the hammer and the truck and I think from the moment those like sort of divides start forming you end up with girls being described as twee and pretty or if they get a bit authoritative it becomes bossy and these kind of words that get thrown around and the moment you started with that it all just starts taking away from a woman's authority as she grows up and tries to own her own voice really very 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 accurate perception i would say ladies yeah, um, at no, we should not have to change. Um, <laughs> it's as simple as that, really. I think it, it says a lot about society when mm. men are treated with a lot more respect and dignity than women for doing the exact same thing. As Katie said, we would be called bossy when a man, when a man would be called strong. Um, and I think, and I, I've certainly experienced that. Um, and I think society, what society is doing is just perpetuating the idea that women 
should submit to men and that they should be less powerful and hold um well hold less power and shouldn't be respected the same because they are a woman and as, as I said in my speech education is the lifeline to prosperity and I really stand by that and how our whole attitudes and society as a whole can change its attitudes from a very young age by ensuring that girls know that what they're doing is worthy and what they're doing is strong and they should never have to bow down or never have to be silenced by a man or do the same as a man to get where they want to go. Thank you, Henrietta. I think that's absolutely spot on. I would set a of colour to that. Do we need to change the way we need to educate our boys then? Yeah, this is this is something that I've always thought very passionately about. Um, I live I live with my boyfriend and we've been together nearly four years and I have changed his perception of women hugely. Not women, no, he wasn't like you know, awful, but I've changed, you know. <laughs> change that you know he, when he does say some things that, that I don't agree with I challenge him on it and that has really made him change his thinking about a lot of things um and the only reason he had those thoughts was because that's what society brings him up like mm. um and I think that if we all had the same education like for instance like sex education I was speaking to my younger sister about this the other day at school we were taken into one room the boys went into another room and we taught totally different things which then makes I think as women we're taught about um we are taught about the male anatomy and all of that mm. as far as I'm as far as I've been told by my my male counterparts my male friends they don't get taught about us which makes them think that they're the important ones and we're not um mm. and I think that's just one example of, of of how if we educated men the same as women and as I said in my speech a lot of history is full of white men doing great things mm -hmm. not a lot of history that we get taught at school is it doesn't teach us about amazing things that women have done I don't I apart from the suffragettes which we didn't really get taught about at school anyway I've mm -hmm. learned most of that through girl guiding mm -hmm. um we don't get taught about amazing women that have done amazing things in history you have to go out and buy one of a book about it or something if you want yeah. to learn about it um and I really think that if we taught men and boys from a young age about amazing women as well um it would make a huge difference oh, i think that's i think that's very wise two amazing women i was talking about the it's florence nightingale and mary seacole who mm. have, have come back into back into parlance courtesy of our very horrible year last year um but again lots of people don't really really know them and they were really feisty women they had to fight really hard and beat down the system to go and do what they felt was right mm. bless them they did and they you know, changed the face of medicine um but uh, no i think i think that's exactly right well thank you for that sally Ann. those are particularly challenging questions that's what we like that's what happens you see you, you're sitting quietly you make your maiden speech and then you know someone stands up from the other side and says would the honorable member <laughs> uh, agree with me that and you then think ah, right I'm gonna take it on it's a great it's a great challenge uh thinking on our feet hey ladies it's what we do it's what we do best now then I think we're going to turn the tables aren't we Hannah I hand over the reins back to you uh, and uh you can put us in in the spotlight um yeah do we do you want to go um in the order that we said before so Maddie Kate Henrietta, then Katie, um, if each of you want to take it in turns and ask a question to, to the uh, brilliant MP to her here. Maddie. Um, yeah, uh, for all of you, really, I guess it's, it's um, probably a bit of a harsh question, but do you think that as your time as MPs, you've, you've done enough so far um, to help women um, in politics you know as women in politics you're in such a powerful position to make a difference in that kind of um space and do you think you've done enough and what else would you like to do to encourage people like us to be in your position in the future um that's right shall i take it first um have i done enough definitely not i don't think you can ever do enough one of the challenges like in any job is a lot of your time is spent subsumed by doing the day-to-day -day job and the challenge, certainly having been on the government benches for my career so far, the challenge is trying to think about ways to demonstrate what you're doing that it, you know, gives you an opportunity for outreach for you know, 
showing, you know, giving leadership and all that sort of thing. Uh, and that can be quite difficult sometimes. I'm very lucky at the moment because I've got this extraordinary uh, brief as part of COP and I'm, I'm, I'm championing everything to do with uh, adaptation resilience to help the, the most vulnerable countries to, to get stronger and trying to find ways to shift the financing that's available to invest in, in green, green finance. Um, and I've taken on the challenge of making, of trying to drive gender responsive financing throughout everything. Uh, and when I started in September, there was a bit of twitching and yes, minister, but actually now people are coming back at me. I'm talking to people all over the world and I'm hiring to, you know, we really want it to be gender responsive. And it's really interesting. Actually, what if you can set, if you can set a marker and be absolutely firm about something in politics, uh, su success starts to be true when somebody else tells you what you started, uh, you know, a few weeks, a few months ago, you know then that it's captured the imagination and then the machinery will change. I'm I'm constantly amazed by how how you can make change if you're clear and you're absolutely solid in your in your position and you stick with it. But I think the challenge with demonstrating that and finding ways to encourage more women um, is very broad. And whichever brief any of us are ever in, the challenge is to go looking for those opportunities to really raise the profile um, of women in those sectors but also to encourage them to stand up. You know, half, half, I always say half, half the challenge uh, to being in politics is being in the room. It, it's kind of quite simple in some ways. Actually, if you're there, if you step across the threshold and participate from, you know, parish council, you know, community action, all the way through to standing for parliament, if you're there, you get to make the decisions quite quickly. Um, it's a... Uh, it's a it's a really sort of simple truth. So encouraging people to get involved, and that can be harder. Interestingly, through COVID, where everything's been virtual, we've seen a lot more engagement in community activities by women who don't have to leave the house to go to a meeting because the meetings are on Zoom. There's been a really interesting shift there, which we're trying to capture and hold to make sure that that can become a normal part of local political activity. So I think there's always more to do, but. Um, finding finding those those hooks in in every brief that we have i mean marsha and you might want to follow on has got this amazing brief at the moment where she is absolutely you know advocating in that space marsha thank you amory uh, and great question maddie and you know have we done enough absolutely not although we are all making progress in all our areas there's always going to be more to do and in my um brief as Shadow Woman and Equality Secretary, I absolutely are seeking out different approaches and responses to how we can not just only get um, more women engaged and participating in the political kind of structures, but obviously in politics, but also how we kind of respond to the many challenges that are facing women uh, today. And that's, you know, we've, we're a year into a pandemic where we've seen a huge and equal impact fall on women and girls and so it's really how we respond to that and really in opposition my job is to try and hold the government to account on its responses to this pandemic to ensure that you know women and girls are not disproportionately impacted in their responses so when the government talk about build 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 that's absolutely right but can we also make sure that how we invest in all of our infrastructure going forward that there's a gendered response to that so the investment in in construction and tech where we absolutely need greater representation of, of women in, in those fields we also look at some of the areas around care whether that's in child care whether that's in education or within healthcare. so it's really making sure that there is a proper response to some of the the issues that we face but then there's also you know the local impact and we're all local members of parliament in our own constituencies and it's the the role we have as community leaders and how we really reach into our communities and the engagement that we have and so for example last night i had a a session with a member of my uh, constituents and colleagues to really encourage young women to think about careers in politics and you know not to think you have to have done all the traditional things of going to university getting a degree then going to going to, into the law or whoever and then thinking well that's the route in there are so many diverse routes into politics and you know for parliament to be truly um reflective of society and actually to be its best 
to really make a difference to our country and also globally, it, it requires women to be from all different backgrounds um, and have all different experiences. Because as I say, diversity in, in our spaces will always lead to better decisions and better policies being made. If we were all the same, I mean, I think we've got uh, four MPs on this call. Imagine if we were exactly all the same and fought the same and believed in exactly the same thing. It wouldn't make for a very good space and it certainly wouldn't make good policy decisions either. So that's why diversity in who we are and how we represent our communities is so important. Thanks, Marsha. Uh, Anne? So it's a comment. Um, I, I, um, the answer to your question, do I think I've done enough? I don't normally say things like this, but I'm going to say yes, because to have done more would have meant to uh, dropped other things that I was working on and we've got so many different things that we're working on. Um, do I think enough has been done? No. Um, do I think I could do more? Yes, but only if I drop something else. So, um, But one of the things that I've really focused on is, uh, and just looking at the elected politics as an example, is is talking to people within my party who are going forward or were going forward for election. We've got the Scottish Parliament general election coming up in May. Uh, talking to them about how you withstand and how you can withstand, shouldn't have to, but you can withstand the personal abuse that you get. And, and working with them to try and help them because to, to be able to withstand that, because I'll say that I was, um, I was in my forties before I developed a thick skin. I was the most easily hurt, most sensitive person you can imagine. Um, and somebody just had to look at me the wrong way and I would run away. Um, and I don't literally run away, but you know what I mean? I would back down and I would think, okay, I can't do this. Um, now I can relatively easily put up with torrents of vicious abuse and lies. And it's wrong that you should have to do that. And, and I think it relates back to what I think something Kate said, you shouldn't just have to be resilient. You should be able to dismantle all of that. But as well as that, it's about building your resilience. So a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is working with people who were ready to run away that I know would be incredible parliamentarians and, and, and doing that. So, yeah, I, I, I don't actually mean to say, to sound like I think, yeah, I've done everything I can do, but you understand the point I was making. No, I do. Thank you, Anne. And I think, I think your point about, yeah, helping people to learn, you know, if we're being polite, the rough and tumble of politics, uh, it isn't always just rough and tumble, um, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, learning those skills and knowing that it's not personal, uh, that it's about politics, I think is a really important lesson. Sally Ann? Have you done enough to help women in politics? Well, I just started, <laughs> got elected in 2019. So um, I think the very fact that I've gone into politics, you know, is, is a good thing. So I think we need a lot more women coming into politics, but it's also about public roles anyway, whether it's a school governor um, or a magistrate or all those public roles that, that you can do is so important. But I do think that, um, the one thing that really, really shocked me when I actually became an MP, because I'd been a district councillor before since 2015, was the social media um, abuse and things. So I don't look at it at all. And I think that's absolutely fine. I think we put the message out that we want to get out, but I don't look at it. And I really was quite gobsmacked um, at this sort of level of um, animosity. Um, and I think you have to say to yourself, and I'm looking at Anne there, you know, I'm grown up, I'm 53 now, I was 53 last week. But even at that age, when you're confident, you've brought a family up, you've had a job, you suddenly get landed into this world where, you know, you're hated because you're a woman or you're a conservative MP or something else, and it goes across the board. And you've just got to think to yourself, Do you know, if I run away, then, it will be those people who perhaps are not decent people coming into this sort of um, job. And we want decent people to come into these um, public roles and political roles. But I do think actually um, 
education, girls' education for girls is so important because it can help combat poverty. It's really good for our local communities. And that's something I really want to focus on in Hastings and Rye. We've got quite serious levels of deprivation. And I think, I can't remember which one, it might have been Maddie talking about um, STEM subjects or mentioning something about science and technology. Mm. I think, or it might have been Katie, I can't remember. It's so important that we encourage girls to do all the things that they might not have considered before. And that's that's vital. So, yep, stand up for women in parliament. Yes. Brilliant. The fact that we're all here, that there are female MPs here is yeah. taking a huge step forward for women. Absolutely. Thank you, Sally Ann. Uh, Kate, what's your question to test us? Um, what what do you think could be done to deal with the uh, um, abuse in the media and online that particularly female MPs face? Um, very, very good question. Marsha, do you want to take that one first? Oh, you're on mute, Marsha. See that? Right, good. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, perfect. Um, so Kate, thanks for that question. Online abuse, um, we've seen the huge increase that online abuse um, as and is having um, on, on women, young women, young girls, but also on female politicians, regardless of um, their political party affiliation, it's utterly reprehensible and has absolutely no place in, in our society. And so I, I strongly believe that there needs to be proper uh, legislation put in place uh, to prevent some of this. And I do think there needs to be more uh, responsibilities placed on a number of our social media companies. Um, I was there part of an event last year where it was looking at the, the abuse um, that women received online. And one of my colleagues, who's Diane Abbott, who's a was the first black MP who was elected over 35 years ago. She actually received the most online abuse of any female MP of us all put together, that one individual. Uh, and you can imagine not just the impact um, that has on her and her mental health, you know, we've all got fixed skin because we've had to really develop it being politicians, but nobody um, deserves to ever enjoy or have to have that treatment. So that is why we need proper legislation in place to ensure that nobody actually has to experience such abuse and also you know we don't want to discourage people from wanting to enter public life because of all the abuse etc we think about Paul the, all the horrible abuse Paul Megan's receiving over the last uh, uh, few days again you know it's it's not any of our media or out online outfits to be um, causing anybody such harm so we need strong robust legislation put in place that holds our media to account and also our social media uh, companies to account as well. Thanks, Marsha. Um, Sally Ann. Thank you, um, Anne Marie. I was going to say I agree with Marsha on many things. We've got an online harms bill coming out um, mm. uh, quite soon. I can't remember. Anne Marie might remember when it's coming out. I think it's quite shortly. It, it's imminent. Yeah. It's yes. Imminent. And I think that one of the things we've really got to ensure is that anything that goes online, so if you were to yell across the street at someone, you know, rude things, blah, 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 that would be a breach of a public order act, for example. So why should it be any different online if you, you know, are rude to people, swear at them online, you know, threaten them with being strung up against a fire or whatever, that should be, that should be taken as physically said to you. So I think it's very important that we say that. Um, I also think that, you know, we have got to bring back the level of debate um, into sort of polite discourse. And it's about talking, you know, we shouldn't be um, talking in politics. And, I, I, you know, I, I, I know it does happen from time to time, but we should be actually discussing locally, whether it's nationally or locally, on a policy level and not on a person or personality level. And I think we've got to get that level of debate back to more polite discourse. Thanks, Alian. And what do you think can be done to deal with uh, online abuse? 
So I have absolutely no idea if my party supports this or not. I don't know if I've got a policy on this. I know we've got a hate crimes bill going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment. But um, my solution is stop all the anonymity. Mm -hmm. Anybody who has a Twitter or Facebook account, we must be able to know who they are. Because if you, you'll notice the difference between Facebook and Twitter. Facebook, most people are not anonymous. You don't accept them as a friend. They can't. You can stop them seeing you. Mm -hmm. um, Twitter is mostly, in my experience, the abuse mostly comes from people who might not even be people. They might be robots, um, you know. But it's people who you cannot identify because if you could identify them, now I don't get the worst of it. Nobody mm -hmm. gets the abuse that Diane Abbott gets. It's absolutely mm -hmm. disgusting. I don't get anywhere near. I wouldn't be in the top twenty. But what I get is almost too difficult to bear if you if you read it. And this is my solution is I just don't I rarely read it. Mm. But um I I guarantee so I could easily, if I knew who these people were, I could take action against them and it would be actionable. But I don't know who they are. And um I also think that people, because I think people and I think lockdown has been terrible for for this because people are 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 becoming a little they're becoming more isolated they don't have the same face-to-face -face contact they're becoming their anxiety levels are higher than they would be if they were able to engage with other people face-to-face mm. -face. so I think people are getting a bit worse but um the the there's something around people will say things to you online that they would never say to you in the pub because I've seen people that I know they're not friends of mine but the people that I know um, and they've said things to me that I think you would never say that to my face, not because you're scared of me, but because you're just not that kind of person. But going online makes you that kind of person. But it's so much worse when it's anonymous and you can hide. So I, I would anonymize, I would stop all the anonymity and see people that only want to do it if they're anonymous. My answer to them is tough, tough luck. Go find somebody else to talk to. Very good, Anne. Thank you. Um, Henrietta and Katie, we take your questions together and then uh, we will try and answer them both. So, Henrietta. Um, so, my question, hopefully on more of a positive note, is um, how do you feel motivated by young people, especially girls, using their voices for change? Good question. And um, Katie. My question is, what issue do you think specifically needs to be tackled in relation to female equality? So obviously we've all spoken about a different issue, but which one would you particularly focus on? Not necessarily one of ours, but something along those lines. Very good. Right, ladies, they've got both motivated for change and what still needs to be tackled. Who wants to take that first? Marsha? Oh, yep, sure thing. OK, so thank you for that. So, um, Issue that probably really needs to, I think we need to really focus on, continue to focus on violence against women and girls. I mean, there is no question that is still a big issue. And as a result of the pandemic, we know that there's been huge increases in this area, particularly around um, domestic abuse. Um, but obviously there are other issues that, that sit alongside that as well. And I think that is the one issue that absolutely needs to be addressed uh, for our, our young people and for women and girls going forward and do you know what really kind of motivates me um particularly um about you know girls wanting to bring about um that change and being that voice for change and you know one of the things that i've been focusing on is about not letting our voices um be silent but actually really lifting up and raising our voices and being that voice for change and events like this are really inspiring and and motivating for me and i'm sure it is uh, for many others that are also um, viewing this, this this evening. But I also think, you know, it's it's really about how the confidence that I think it really gives young women when they realise they do have a voice and when they realise that by speaking out can actually make a difference and can actually bring about that positive change. So I think as young people and particularly as young women, I'm seeing more and more actually them wanting to speak out and wanting to be part of that change, talking about what we've talked about this evening, all important issues, be that climate justice, um, online abuse and bullying and so forth. But more importantly, it's about wanting to be part of that change, you know, wanting to actually take action and be part of that change. And I think 
that is hugely inspiring and motivating for, for me, particularly in the role that I do, because I think in that space, again, without those voices, young people's voices, women's voices, then we're not going to bring about that real positive change. And we certainly won't really bring about true gender e equality either. Brilliant, thank you, Marsha. Anne, what still needs to be tackled for female equality and what motivates you? On, on the what still needs to be tackled, Katie, um, I co-chair along with uh, Don Butler, a Labour MP, I co-chair the APPG on unconscious bias. And I think there's a huge body of work to be done. We've talked about this, some other people have talked about this tonight, about it's not just about us as girls and women, you know, um, changing our way of thinking. It's about educating boys and men as well. But again, it's not just about educating them. It's not, it's not just about allowing them to see the unconscious bias that perhaps they're using. Um, it's also us. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, I never ever, since somebody pointed this out to me a couple of years ago, I never say to a little girl what I always instinctively want to say to a little girl when I see her, and that is, you look so pretty. Never say that now. I find a way to establish that she's clever or she's um, she said something really interesting because people go to little girls, but oh, you're so pretty, you're so beautiful. So therefore you grow up thinking this is, this is what, how people value me. They don't say it to little boys. They say, wow, you're really smart or you're really good at that skill, that thing that you're doing. So I think we as women and girls experience our own unconscious bias towards ourselves and other people, other women and girls but the men and boys do as well. So in terms of what motivates me, I just, you know, I just really, having grown up really shy and nobody that knows me ever believes this, but it's true, I was really shy. But even when I was pretending not to be shy, I was quaking whenever I had to speak in public or whenever I had to try and make my voice heard in a meeting. And I just covered it well. And it just really, it just makes my heart sing when I experience, I go to meetings in my constituency, young women and girls, and they just expressing their views. And they may be hiding it really well as well, but I don't think they are. I just think women, girls today are growing up just with a little bit more confidence than I had at that age. And just, just watching it, and sometimes I go, oh my goodness, you're very confident. And then I have to tell myself unconscious bias, and their confidence is a brilliant thing and and it really does motivate me thank you Anna. that's a lo lovely example um sally ann thank you Anne marie i would say what does motivate me is that young women like you might look at someone like me and says well if she can go and be a mp then i can because i think that's um something you know we're all different you know i was did law, was a full-time mum, did magistrates. I think, it, you know, when you put your mind to something, and this is what the message I want to get to young women out, when you decide to do something and you work hard for it, you can achieve anything you want. And that's what motivates me. So, you know, when you're bullied at school or you've got problems with social media, just think to yourself, it just goes over the top you just carry on you can achieve what you want to do and you know I'm, I'm sort of you know not your typical MP I don't think any of us are Marsha's not Anne isn't Anne Marie isn't we're all very different women so what motivates me is that you look at us all in parliament and think well if they can do it so can I that's really important and then the other thing about the issue that we want to that you want to that we still need to focus on i think it all boils down to education and's right you know it is education is so fundamental in so many things and it's about educating women to have more confidence and also educating boys and young men to look at women as equals and we're different we are different and that's a good thing but we're equal and that's really important Thanks, Alianne. Uh, well, I think uh, I've written down some of the same things already, so I won't repeat them, but I think Alianne and I think all of us uh, have a clear focus that education uh, in all its forms is, uh, I think, critically important to getting that female equality across the board. Um, and 
there are there are areas where to do that we will we still need to make more legislative change not you know in the uk we have you know equal pay and equal voting rights and all those things but uh those small things that shift and as we as we think clearly we need to see them and then change them and i think the on the online harms bill is one where there will be i mean i think you know men suffer from it too but certainly when you look at the stats uh female mps get much more abuse than uh men and i think the same is true through the spectrum for young women as well so i think there are there are some legislative things that we need to do to enable uh that female real female equality not just on paper um but i would just leave you one thought in terms of my motivation um and how we make sure that we get uh, more girls involved in politics at every level because politics is about everything it's about you know the, the community you live in your country the globe the the place you work in your school it's all about decisions taken for the people in that community and the key thing is to speak up so i would i would challenge you all um you're all involved you've stepped into the arena of wanting to have your voice heard because you know that you have something important to bring persuade one other girl to do the same and remember that when a man stands up to speak apologies to any men on the call um they'll do it with 10 percent of the information they're happy to talk and fight for a cause where they've only got 10 percent knowledge most women won't stand up until they're well over 80 percent certain of their case 100 <laughs> percent in sally ann's case so we have we allow ourselves a natural disadvantage so be confident always in what you what you know is good enough to stand up with there's always more to know and that's always a challenge and a personal challenge but never be afraid to not speak up your voice and your knowledge it will be at least probably many times better than many of the men who are very happy to push their voice forwards uh, and that's a, that's an old it's a sort of it's a strength thing and I, they don't mean it badly i mean some of my colleagues can talk on anything for hours it's amazing and it's lovely to listen to but their knowledge is no greater we have to have the confidence to know that our our level of knowledge whatever it is is always going to be at least as good as the boys uh, so never think that you can't stand up and uh, pick a fight you might have to practice being able to keep going because they can be quite you know forceful but never never think that we will always have as much information we just have to be confident in that belief but encourage one other person to step into the limelight with you and with that we very quickly find uh, that we have got female voices speaking up for the issues that are important that make the world we are all living in and that you will be living in for much longer than we will the sort of place that you want to have for your families uh, and the generations that come after you so thank you all Marsha over to you Thank you, Anne-Marie. And can I just say thank you um, to each of you. This has been a truly inspiring and I think a fantastic evening. Henrietta, Kate, Katie, Maddie, you gave wonderful um, maiden speeches. Well done for putting those together. But more importantly, in terms of the confidence that you eluded when you delivered them so powerfully. And I don't know about you, but I feel really inspired and excited about the future of politics, because if that's the direction of travel for each of you, then you know we are in for such a treat and the, i'd say with each of the speeches the issues that you that you each covered are, are really important issues and and continue to really strive on those and wanting to push for that change in your local communities and within your local networks with your friends and so forth and i do hope that one day um that you will too be on those front benches in the house of commons because you will have an equal right to be there just as much as anybody else so well done and in the meantime please please do stay engaged and strong in what is this male dominated world but you know I think we've all said it here this evening it's about your voices and you know think of the context of being that voice for the voiceless as well because not everybody will will be in the same space as you so think of the fact that you're speaking and being the voice for others around the world but also locally so very happy International Women's Day and can I just say a huge thank you to everybody that also joined us on this call and to my fellow colleagues, my MPs that are also on this call. It was great actually being on a panel with you, with you all as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So much, everyone. Great work. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye-bye.